just coming here made me realize how much better an in-person conference still is. It just, it doesn't even compare. So it's been, it's been really great being here again. Hi, I am Sherry Sontag and I'm with Bloomberg. And I am really excited to see a full room and a little bit nervous. And one of the things that's gonna happen here is there are slides, but I'm only gonna generally follow them. If I look at them, you guys are gonna be so bored. So we're gonna try to do this just without those too much. So I, I come, there we are. I come from Bloomberg and I am the person that sometimes people are afraid of. Um, we operate like 300 startups. We have a lot of developers. And from the time they brought me in, I was the person who was asked to try to bring some sanity to the code base. It was started with the Lacosian package groups and John Lacos, and I still rely on standing on his thousand page books to be six foot tall. And it went on to other, other forms of sanity. But Ultimately, I touched about 10% of the code base. Uh, why was I there? Um, well, I wasn't there because I took on the US Navy and was willing to like challenge them for classified information, although I did. That happened. Uh, more fun was when my son found out I was a song lyric. Um, I was there because my bosses thought if I could talk to submariners and get them to talk about classified information and things they were afraid to tell, I could reach out to a bunch of developers and help them when they were confronted with not getting, being able to get their code checked in. And I could talk them off the ledge and I could convince them that there were some rules worth following. Part of the thing though was we were baking them up a little bit as we go along. We had 10% of people in our version of a monorepo. The rest of the company really was very independent. It really was like 300 startups. And something started happening though. We started creating, especially around the way you name code, kind of a shared language, even when we were only 10%. We had Lacosian package groups. Um, John came up with the idea that code could be organized in three letter, according to three letter mnemonics that people would really know who the branding was. And then there were people who just thought that was a little bit oblique and they wanted longer package names. So in order to preserve John's package groups, we also said, okay, give us really long package names, nine or more alphanumeric characters. So we started getting track util, um, bang API. And it was making me a little bit crazy. I'm the writer. So I started asking them to tell me what was in their code. What are you doing? What are you, what are you um, trying to create here? It's a database access library, track DBACC. It's a message library, foo service message. Um, it's my real utils, they really are utils, but there are really low level utils, suffix core. And we started just sharing this language, but to a large degree, only 10% of the code base had to confront it had to talk to me and had to deal with the fact that we wanted them to name their code a certain way. But a funny thing started happening. We came up with a build system that became really robust. And the tools behind that build system got really good. And more and more teams that had been avoiding our world were coming and there was no bar to entry. It was a really low bar to entry. Make yourself visible. We will make it work. As long as what you depend on is also in the build system. And teams were coming one after another and saying, we would like to be part of this. And we realized we had an opportunity to come together. We had an opportunity to take what had been almost a laboratory with that 10% of people who had to talk to me and bring them together. But we couldn't just turn on those roles. There were still a lot of people who were very good at avoiding me and kind of a little afraid. What we had to do instead was reach out to the developers and see if we could get them on board. So where are we on these silly sides? Okay, I'm a journalist, I'm an investigative journalist, and I know people like to joke about journalists, but if you do it well, you've gotta be open. You've gotta be willing to hear anything. You've gotta be generous. 
You've got to take the time to listen hard. Interviews are tough. You really have to pay complete attention to what somebody else says. And you've got to be humble. You've got to know that you can get it wrong. And that if you get it wrong, you need to be able to go back and get it right. And you have to ask questions. One of my jobs at Bloomberg is to talk to all the new hire classes. I talk to them because we have this culture of volunteering. Most of what Bloomberg makes goes to make the world a better place. And I want them to know this is the most fun they'll ever have at work. Because, but while I've got them there on their graduating day, I tell them, ask questions. Don't nod when somebody says something technical that you don't understand. Don't just try to look smart when you're completely befuddled. Get people to talk about what they want to do. They really like doing it also. And I needed to learn that the hard way. I needed to be able, in fact, I did it as a badge. I know way less than you do. Tell me how this fits in. It's amazing how you can get people thinking of stepping back from the details and every last line of their code and get them thinking about how it fits into the bigger picture. Because when you ask questions, people are really to start thinking about the answers. So here we were. We had this kind of an idea of how we should name our code. We now had eight, an audience of 80% of the code base. And really, we have more than half a billion lines of C++ guys. We have 40,000 projects, published projects, and close to 8,000 developers. We had this opportunity to get 80% of them on the same page. So we came up with an idea. We should sell this on how much sense it makes. Code should be unique. It should. If at its best, provide at-a-glance metadata. And it should support what Bloomberg is built on, which is reusable, shareable objects. People should not have to worry about code collisions. But it turned out, more than anything else, our, our guys wanted any rules we set up to be, I told you all about that stuff, uh, to be easy to find, easy to follow, enforced across the board, and enforced early. Because when we were only dealing with 10% of the code base, sometimes somebody would come into our world and have to adjust. There should be no more late surprises. We should do this with total empathy. That's if somebody is going to take the trouble to develop and work hard, right? That we, it is our job to make it really easy for them to follow whatever it was we set up. People also wanted to be consulted. They wanted to have a say in what went on in their world. And they needed to trust that I was coming in. I mean, I was told that sometimes when I call people, they would get a little afraid because I'd been around for a long time. I, they needed to trust that I was coming in, wanting them to tell me what they needed. So first thing happened, I had to confront the fact that our naming system may not be as popular as I thought it was. I knew it was different. It is not industry standard, right? To have nine or more alphanumeric characters in your namespaces and your library names. Right? I mean, is it? I mean, do you usually have like nine characters? You do. OK. Anybody else? All right. Anybody else have much, way shorter namespaces and names? Yeah, see? A lot more, right? So I held my breath and asked, started making phone calls and asking the question, do you want us to throw this all out? Because if that was the vote, I had to go with it, right? And I had been asking people to do this now for a really long time. So there was way more ego in it than there should have been. I was kind of scared. But a funny thing happened. People said, I love our code base. It has these easy to identify layers. We have the database access layer. We have the message layer. We have the types layer. And it's like, oh my god, I kind of did that by accident because I didn't want to keep typing util and utils. I just thought it was really awful. But people began to rely on it. People said, we like the fact that at Bloomberg, we don't want you to go from company to company. We want you to come to Bloomberg. And if you get bored, find something cool to do on the next team over. We want you to make a career here, which means we have a lot of people inheriting code. You inherit what you own. You inherit what you depend on. And people were really appreciative of the fact that when they sat down and they looked at what their code was, they knew what it was. They had a really good idea. This product for this project doing this architectural use. 
and they wanted to keep it. And another funny thing happened is if you made a library and it said, this is what my library is for, it tended to stay pretty well factored. You didn't have a lot of bitbuckets going on. So people wanted to keep what we had. Some were very attached to Lycosian package groups. That branding was really important to them, and we were going to keep that. And some were really attached to what had begun, started as a way of protecting Lycos' namespace and the three-letter characters, these longer package names. So we were going to have practice, a, a process of erasure, enhancement and not erasure. So how are we going to go about this? We decided to break the problem up into iterative proposals. How would we base our library and header names? Um, how would we, could we get people to agree that if you have one name, it should map through to everything? You know, just things that you want to ask. So we just started making, we just decided to craft research our heads off, use that research to craft proposals. And by the time we published a proposal, and we published them in a forum where everybody could come on and, 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 and comment. And then we had to encourage debate. And you know, it didn't take that much encouragement. On the plane ride here, a kid said to me, oh, that was your project. I was having such a good time watching the pages and pages and pages of comments go by. Well, a funny thing happened. As those pages and pages and pages of comments went by, we noticed that people were actually coming to a consensus. In a weird way, they were landing by themselves on what they agreed on. And we just, a lot of the times, we were just mining that. So what happened here? OK, so we had the three of them. Uh, we had these long namespaces. They were all one big word after Jackie Jekyll's Anybody remember Sesame Street? People, we said, what if we did nested namespaces? You could take those, your product, and you'd register it, and that would be your branding forever. And for each project, you could have another namespace in there. And finally, for each architectural use. And we, you're, you're, we, you could now have libraries that were identifier one, dash identifier two, dash identifier three, and headers that use forward slashes instead, so you could have collapsible header trees. But if you did that, we were going to ask you to adopt a registration system so there'd be no ambiguous lookups if people were going to be sloppy about writing code. And then people turned out to love the registration system because it meant the first thing you did when you were about to write code is you could say, is this taken? Is this legal? Is this going to fly? And once you pass registration, you were done. We were never going to bug you again. It went through. Would you be willing to take that namespace, all, you know, whatever, whether it's one big fat flat word or three identifiers for a fully qualified namespace, and use that for everything? publish your binary with it, spell your headers starting with it, would you basically be willing to map? And people like that too. Because if something wasn't building, you knew exactly what, what package needed to go get fixed. Nobody had to research. And finally, how should namespaces be spelled? People were going along with the idea of long. Although there was some debate as to whether or not long meant seven, eight, or nine. And a funny thing happened with that, as people were really arguing, we found out that fully half of our code base, remember I said I had control over 10%? Half of the code base had adopted nine or more alphanumeric characters. People saw what people were doing in the little area I had control over, and they were carrying through with it. So this was like all easier than we thought it was going to be. I mean, I was like feeling really, really good. And well, maybe it was kind of too easy. Right? There needed to be a snag. And we hit one, and we hit it big. We started to turn on the registration system. And the idea was each time you added a namespace identifier to the string, you were really naming a new package. And we thought we had been talking to a lot of people. I mean, our requests for comment were really busy, and, and people were getting on the phone and discussing it with us. Only the people who had avoided us really well really avoided us. They weren't listening to what our, our newsletters were. They weren't watching these requests for comments. They were in their world doing what worked for them, especially our mathematicians, our quants. And that what they did with their namespaces is they actually, to a large degree, followed the idea that my package would be named with, with at-a-glance metadata. But they also used a lot of sub-namespaces for internal organization. 
and we had inadvertently using warning errors, thinking we were using warnings first, thinking we were being careful. We had inadvertently blocked everything they were doing because they were they they had turned on warnings as errors. They were not playing games, and suddenly we were saying, "Oh, you need a new package. You need to register." And by the way, a lot of them, these guys were busy. And they were furious. And they called me up, and I thought, OK, I've got this. I know how to talk people off a ledge. I could talk to submariners. I could talk to you, right? And, and they called me up, and they said, Sherry, what are you doing to us? On what planet do you think we want to register everything? One layer, two layers should be enough. And I said, you know, show me your code. Show me what you're doing. Let me come back to my team and make the case that we have it wrong. But developers, guys, how often are you expecting someone to say, we're going to change what we're doing because you're doing something different? They didn't hear that. What they heard was, OK, let me keep arguing until I get my way. And they insisted on having a meeting with my manager. And <laughs> I, I didn't want that. I was like, this was my, this is the part of the project I was leading. I want them to hear me. But my manager was a little smarter and a little less ego invested than I was at the time. and he made the meeting, calmed everybody down, turned it over to me. And by the time we were done talking, we had changed the way we did namespaces. Instead of every new identifier becoming adding a new, you know, Sherry, Laura, Kristen, Juan, it was Sherry, Laura, Kristen was the package, and Juan was the sub-identifier, and so was Juan Daniel. You didn't, we didn't register it. We didn't look at it. It was going to be unique because it was in the other namespaces, right? It wasn't going to clash with anything. I mean, unless people were, I mean, because those other identifiers were, were registered. And you could do whatever you want within your own code. You could organize it however you wanted, and we would get out of your way. Because what we needed, what was important, one of, the, one of our, the people on our management committee once said to me, when you're making a rule, make sure you don't worry about the small stuff. Don't worry about things that are unimportant. How you organize your code once we know you're unique and easy to read is completely up to you. It was not important. So um, we learned what we didn't know. We did that. Where did we land? We did that. OK, so now we had. We called, instead of leaf namespaces, we called them package leaf namespaces. The namespace that would name your package would be different from everything else that you added beneath it. And, base, and you could still have namespaces that only held other namespaces, and they would be purely for branding. So there would be no ambiguity, and everybody would know what you had and would be able to read your code. And nobody who accidentally were calling two packages, no innocent third party up above, upstream, could end up with getting the wrong thing compiled. So after that, Daniel turned around and, and, and looked at some developer friends who were even, who needed to do the nitty gritty, and they started to create tools to make this all work. We also um, started to create tools to scrape existing older namespaces together, because as people have said over and over this week, you can't just change everything on people. You have to at least temporarily grandfather things. We find that temporary means that some people would like to bring everything into one system. But if you don't want to and you've had something, we'll make it work for you. Uh, we did a formal doc with all the three pieces put together and invited one last round of debate. And we kind of embraced the idea that consensus wasn't 100% agreement. The other day, I was on, somebody called me up and they, we had to land it on alphanumeric characters because we had dashes and slashes and things going on in between identifiers. And we didn't want to complicate things by having non architectural word spacers within a single namespace identifier. And somebody really wanted to use dashes. And I said, You know, your, your, your friends all voted the other way. And he said, Yeah, I will forever disagree with that. But, you know, that's the way they went. So I have to live with it. Uh, so what's next? We want to have tools to make this all automatic. It turns out nobody really wants to be an expert in how to name their code. Um, and we want, first, we want to enlist a group of first responders to say, OK, you tackle namespaces. This thing, maybe it's forward declarations. Maybe it's the way we, we, we the APIs for our service code. This is giving me agita. This is giving me nightmares. Can you guys go in and try to bring some sanity to this part of the process? So 
I come back to, how do you do this? How do you bring this home? Just be open. Believe that people really want to do the right thing. They're not lazy. They're overwhelmed. Be humble. Recognize you don't always know what the right thing is. And finally, be generous. Don't worry about whether or not somebody heard you when you were shouting out that you were publishing a request for comment. Go find them. It's, your, it's not their job to know what you're doing. Anyway, that's it. Thank you for inviting a journalist into your world. Is there any time for questions, if anybody has? We have five minutes for questions. Is anybody interested? Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. It was great. Um, I'm wondering, what's the internal mechanism to do the whole registration? Right now, the internal me mechanism is, is there's an online version, and then we have this sort of this screen version, this UI that you could use. Um, people kind of hate it. In fact, somebody, we were at dinner, and somebody said, if I publish and I forgot to register my namespace, and it's otherwise legal, I don't want an error that tells me, go back and publish your namespace. If it's good, I want, the da I want a key that says, oh, you haven't, you haven't published. It's legal. Would you like us to publish it for you? Clunk. So the mechanism right now is a little kludgy, but we were, are trying to do more to let people not have to be an expert in that particular sort of, you know, in that particular process, because how often in the end do you need it, right? Hi. Thank you for the pre presentation. So I think um, when, you're, when you're describing your the whole namespace naming process, I guess it's really hitting at the topic of uh, stakeholders, right? That on the management level, it's really important to identify stakeholders and identify the people who are affected by decisions, and then also to do that early. So I'm, so I'm wondering, are there any lessons learned specifically for strategies you can use to identify who might actually be affected by the changes that are being brought in, and how do you bring them on board early? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. We were just discussing how we, we may be looking at forward declarations, and we were wondering whether or not Christian's Clang tidy code could be a good way of identifying some things. Really, I, I started by interviewing. I started by going around and asking. And for every person who has, I mean, this is a little bit like kludgy, for every person who has complained, I've asked them if they wanted to be on my first list of, of, of people to talk to. I am begging people to read our newsletter, but honestly, part of it is you have to pay attention to who is not in the code base yet, who may be coming in. Do whatever research you can to figure out who's, who may be surprised by it. I think it's getting easier now for us to figure out who's not yet in our build system. And those are the people I should be reaching out to also because we don't want to inadvertently build a wall that keeps people from coming in. But yeah, a lot of it is don't get complacent that if you're publishing a newsletter and talking to people that you're hitting everybody. And if somebody calls up at the end and you feel like you've got it all down, ask them to show you what they're doing. That may mean that you need to make another change. It doesn't mean you change for everything. But if somebody has a point like the quants did, you need to be willing to like adjust to that too. So yeah, it's hard. It's, it's hard, especially with, for us, because we're a really big company and we're like scattered. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you. So kind of on the smaller side, um, in pull requests, you generally do need to build consensus between like the submitter and the reviewer. And I've come across many different situations where there's just like a lot of conflict there. I was wondering if you might have um, had any other recommendations for how to get over some of the sticking blocks around something like that? You know, it's, it's, it's a funny thing. Part of my job beyond this has always been helping people get their code checked in. Or, or, and, and there are times that somebody wants to change something and they can't get their clients to pay attention to a PR. And honestly, I had to learn how to do this differently. I used to just, like, if I thought I could solve a problem, I'd flash out a, an instant message that said, come into my Zoom, let's talk. Now I've learned to say, gee, I see there's a problem and I think I could help. Would you like to come into my Zoom? Because it was sounding like I was ordering them in. I just, I do it by starting conversations. I, it's very funny because there's been some discussion in my team about whether or not that scales. But I find that the more I take time to talk to people, they start talking to each other. And things, like if I've touched 10 people on an issue, 
I stop seeing the issue. So there must be something going on after, after I start. It's talking, it's communication. And you've got to start with the idea that the, the person who isn't adjusting, isn't changing to go with this new thing that maybe you're trying to do, may have a reason. It may be code that they don't know will work with it, or they may not actually know how to change. That, that's a big issue with Python right now, right? Getting from two to three, there's nothing automatic about it. It's hard. And I've been, been brought in on those meetings too, to try to work through what people thought were really clear sets of instructions to realize that they're not so clear. So yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's, the, it's gotta be the human process in technology. I guess that's what I'm here to tell you guys. Bring back the humanity to technology. You'll get to know a lot of people anyway. And you know what? We could, we, could, we could all connect a little bit better and be a little kinder to each other sometimes. Hi. Hi, thanks so much for the talk. So I'm uh, building a mental picture in my head how it works. And I have one contradiction that I would like you I to I have explain. a couple of, you know, there are, you could come look at them later, you know, like what these, these namespace things look like. I just thought every time I tried to throw a slide up that did that, I just started chewing on my own tongue. But I would, I would be really happy to like show you the nitty gritty. The reason I didn't do that in the talk, guys, is we don't think we've come up with the perfect way to name code. We think we came up with a way that our group of people could get behind and agree to. And the thing that you should take home isn't every long namespace is wonderful, it's how do you get people to start talking to each other and listen to each other as opposed to talking at each other. How do you get people on board? Sure, sure. But the question is kind of higher level than that. Okay. So you said there's very, very low barrier to entry. So basically you would accept pretty much any code. Somebody would come in and join your build system with whatever code they have. And then there as was this- As long as everything they're depending on is also in the build system. Okay, right. And then there was, um, good point. And then there was uh, no late surprises. So I, I, I come in- I Wait, then there was what, I'm sorry? No late surprises. No late changes. Oh, no late surprises, yeah. Right. So I come in, I have my code which may not follow the rules. I am okay, you know, you are okay, the build system is okay to accept me, but then uh, I need to follow the rules. So how does that work? Like, at, what point, at, at which point are rules enforced? Well, the rules are enforced the first time you publish or you could run your, your code through our static analysis system. But we are going crazy trying to get the word out that people should absolutely register first. If you register first, you know that you have cleared the hurdle. And, and we, we, are, we are having to publish, we are having to announce. The same way, you know, we, bought the, we used to be able to sort of look at everybody's code, that's why we have DBACC and core and service message as suffixes. Now, we, we had to, in order to automate, just go with length. We're gonna to have to publish the idea that if we want a shared language and really to, easy to identify code, that maybe people should continue to use that length well. So if I get nothing across to my developers early, it's that you're gonna please, please register first. And the first time you try to get anything into your repo, it's gonna say, did you register your code? Now, if you could, there are some people who are gonna get caught later than we'd like. Um, I don't know how to get around that. At a certain point, we have to get that word out. You know, you have to communicate. I see, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Jess. Hi. Um, I really liked your theme of iteration and kind of using the further use cases to create like that iteration, but I was curious when, how you personally or your team found the distinction between times where you should iterate and times where like they should iterate and how you kind of went about kind of finding that distinction. Now you're talking about how, but been presenting the rule, the new rules? Yeah, so like when you present a new rule, when, how did you decide when you should iterate on the rule and kind of expand its use cases versus when your rule worked? We, we decided to iterate because we were afraid we would get into conversations that were way too complex. And so what was the first thing? The idea is that a namespace needed to be registered and may or may not be nested. That just seemed like its own thing, no matter what, right? And then how could namespaces be used to name all the rest of your code? That felt good. And then that left that little controversial area for what does your name look like? Should you be naming your code you know, with five letters or seven letters or 10 letters? Should everything go back to John Lakos's package groups or can we live with this dichotomy? That felt like it was its own. 
we felt our way around. It's never going to be perfect. Uh, I, I, you know, and people got one piece and not the other. And it's, it just goes back to just keep talking to people. I did not do a single proposal where I hadn't talked to at least 20 or 30 people to get them to at least start sanding the rough edges and tell me where they, where they came on certain areas. I did a little bit uh, like, you know, just a sampling, just to figure out how not to get tied up in too many knots. Uh, our session is over. If anybody wants to keep talking to me, um, I guess I'll get out of the room and clear for the next person and keep talking. <laughs>